Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our 2021 Waterloo Engineering Reunion. My name is Mary Wells, and I'm so proud and privileged to be the Dean of the Faculty of Engineering. I'm here today, actually, in our newest building, E7, uh, to bring you some remarks um, and to really welcome you to hear what's been going on in our Faculty of Engineering uh, over the past year. Uh, next slide, please. Before I start my remarks, I did want to do a territorial acknowledgement in terms of the land that the University of Waterloo um, sits upon. And much of our work takes place on the traditional territory of the neutral Anishinaabeg and Haudenosaunee peoples. Our main campus is situated on the Haldeman Tract, the land promised to the Six Nations that includes six miles on each side of the Grand River. And you can see what this looks like uh, in the diagram just on the right hand side. Our active work toward reconciliation takes place across all of our campuses through research, learning, teaching, and community building, and is centralized within our, within our Indigenous Initiatives office. I also want to acknowledge the, the, the tragic and news that we heard just last week about the 215 remains of children that were found uh, near that residential school in Kamloops. I know as a, uh, personally, but as a country, we are grieving, and I can't imagine how our Indigenous uh, peoples are feeling about this loss. Next slide, please. 2020 was a difficult year for all of us, and, for our particular, and in particular for our faculty in many ways. We lost a number of our founding and early professors, including Doug Wright, Park Riley, Tom Bruskowski, Ken Driscoll, Carl Thompson, and Ralph Haas, and these people were all acknowledged at our September reunion. Since that time, we've also lost a, a number of other professors. Alan Plumtree, who put the university on the map with the Waterloo Pump. Igor Ikovic, one of our younger professors in systems design engineering, who was really a beloved uh, professor of our undergraduate students for his warmth and kindness and his wonderful approach to teaching. And we also lost Pearl Sullivan, the eighth Dean of Engineering and my predecessor. She was a dear friend and a force to be reckoned with, and she will be greatly missed by all who knew her. Next slide, please. It's been a very interesting year. This was our second year of educating future engineers, predominantly remotely during the pandemic. I just started in my role as the, the, uh, the ninth Dean of Engineering last July, July, and some people referred to me as the pandemic dean. So I, I hope to outlive that legacy in terms of uh, the changes that we're hoping uh, in terms of the optimistic return uh, this fall that we'll be talking about. Next slide, please. Despite the difficulties we face and the challenges, uh, I'm so proud of the resilience of our students, our faculty and our staff, despite the adversary and challenges we faced all this year. We dug deep, we pivoted, we showed the grit that we needed to and the resilience while increasing wellness and mental health supports and resources for students, our faculty and our staff. Wellness really has been a key priority and focus for myself during this very difficult year. And some of the things we've been doing are running workshops for our students, faculty and staff around, uh, you know, dealing with uh, grief, coping with chronic anxiety, um, how to continue to stay positive and optimistic um, and, and offering kind of weekly group therapy sessions, uh, grief therapy uh, who have lost, for so many of us that have lost friends and family during the pandemic. Next slide, please. So. On a very positive note, we are preparing to return to campus this fall. I just want to walk you through a little bit about what that will look like. We will be, right now we're planning for about 50% return to campus and 50% online delivery. And we've done that purposefully, this kind of hybrid mode to make sure that we can accommodate uh, everyone, really. Uh, as part of that, we will, still can, we will be guided by public health. Uh, in terms of what the best knowledge and practices are as we return to campus in the fall. At this point in time, we believe we will still wear masks indoors, uh, continue to practice physical distancing, and we will have additional cleaning in place. And in terms of the 50% of what we offer to our students face-to-face, -face, we are working with our faculty to determine what is that best t way to use that um, very important face-to-face -face time in terms of the labs that we offer, the tutorial sections, as well as the lecture material. So we are working uh, in each course with each cohort, with each department and faculty, with each department of school to figure out what that is. 
And as I said, accommodations will be made for those who can't travel to campus. So in addition to offering these things face to face, we will offer, also be offering um, all these materials remotely as well. Next slide, please. So as I said, the safety and well-being of Waterloo Engineering's community remain my top priority and will continue to be guided by the public health guidelines. And I'm so optimistic as I look today and tomorrow and into the future at the availability of the vaccines and the, the expanded rollout of these vaccines. And I think there's really good reason to be optimistic about being back campus this fall. And then I hope by winter, the winter term in 2022, really a much more normal situation. Next slide, please. Co-op. So co-op has, I just want to touch on this a little bit. Co-op has been an ongoing challenge. Many of the jobs were moved to a remote kind of uh, offering and our employers have been accommodating uh, as well. Uh, the border closures, safety concerns and work from home orders really did impact our co-op work terms as would be expected during a global pandemic. Despite that, we still managed to maintain uh, a 92.8% employment rate, which I'm very, very proud of. It took an enormous amount of effort to be able to do that in terms of uh, finding jobs for our students, uh, helping them to be successful, and also thinking about ways that we could support them. If we think about kind of what we're calling an adjusted employment rate, uh, we can think of that number being closer to 85%. For safety reasons, some students opted out of the work terms during COVID to take courses instead. And so when we think about really uh, th that true percentage, it's more like 85%. Still, despite that, uh, when, I when I talk to my fellow deans across the country, we fared much better in terms of our ability to still provide our students with uh, the co-op experiences that, that have really come to be an important part of the Waterloo Engineering brand. Uh, in terms of earnings, you can see the amount of earnings that the students have made at 117 million. Uh, that's just amazing. And just to give you a sense of what co-op students make these days, uh, the engineering students earned an average of close to about $23,000 uh, US dollars on the US work terms in 2020. So that's a, a very good wage uh, for, for these co-op students. In terms of what they made in the Canadian work term, it was closer to about $14,000. And in terms of just some numbers, since we're engineers and architects, we love numbers, uh, about 8,500 co-op positions. Again, a remarkable achievement during a global pandemic and about close to 3,500 employers uh, hired students over the last six terms. And next slide, please. We have developed a strategic plan, and I must say it was my predecessor, Pearl Sullivan, who led this initiative. So we do have a strategic plan uh, from 2020 to 2025. Obviously, the strategic plan was developed uh, prior to COVID, so it doesn't think of the disruption that a global pandemic would have caused or some of the things that have become very important since that time. But really, when we think about the overall kind of goal, uh, we really want to continue to inspire leaders to define new frontiers. Uh, uphold our tradition of cooperative education. We will continue to, to stimulate our entrepreneurial spirit and research imagination. Above all, our engineers and architects are committed to serving society and building a better future for generations to come. And I know one of my priorities as the Dean right now is addressing some of the ways we can best serve society uh, through things such as the UN Sustainable Development Goals and how do we get our students and our faculty and staff to engage with some of these goals as they represent some of the most challenging and important problems our world faces today. Next slide, please. So these are just some stats. We continue to be the largest engineering school. And these are just some of the data from uh, 2019 to 2020. Uh, just to give you a sense of the size of the engineering school and how it has grown. So in terms of undergraduate students, we have close to 8,600. Um, out of that mix, it's about 13% international. That tends to be on the low end compared to other engineering schools. And if you just want some comparators, U of T is more closer to about 40% uh, international students. It's been a purposeful decision that we've decided to continue to have lower numbers of international students uh, because of the commitment we feel to our domestic students and to our students in Ontario. Uh, we have about close to 2,100 graduate students, uh, just over 330 faculty, uh, 256 staff and last year we kind of reached a milestone when we just went over 50,000 alumni so we, we're now at just 50,700 alumni and after this year's convocation that'll num that number will go up even more. We continue to be a top 50 engineering school in the world and that's based on some of the world rankings. Next slide please. In terms of the way the faculty is made up we do have uh, eight departments uh, 
in terms of, that represent both engineering and they, it also spans and includes a school of architecture as well as this Conrad School of Entrepreneurship and Business. Those eight departments uh, go on to offer 15 different bachelor degree programs. Some of them are really um, specific to the department uh, and that disciplinary area of knowledge, but a number of them are interdisciplinary. And both within our Faculty of Engineering, but then across our Faculty of Engineering to do some collaborative programs with the Faculty of Math as well as the Faculty of Science. And we also offer 37 graduate degree programs. So this is just a listing of our departments. Um, you can see that we've got uh, six that are really focused on the engineering and then the two schools. And one of the unique characteristics of Waterloo Engineering that I think is a huge advantage for us is the fact that we have all of our engineering programs and our School of Architecture embedded in a faculty structure that's with um, a school of entrepreneurship and business. And the huge opportunities that provides to us in terms of um, taking advantage of that synergy and the interdisciplinary opportunities, the connection between engineering and business, the connection between architecture and business. So it's a huge opportunity for us. And most faculties and universities are not organized in this way. So I, I plan to, as Dean, uh, take advantage of this as much as possible. Next slide, please. This just gives us a sense of the undergraduate enrollment uh, this past fall and how it divides out among our different uh, departments and schools. Uh, you'll see that Con the Conrad School is not listed here because they really do only offer a graduate level program right now. Um, and so you can see our biggest department is our electrical and computer engineering uh, program with close to 3,000 students. Our next biz biggest is our mechanical and mechatronics engineering uh, group. Uh, followed by civil and environmental engineering, um, and then uh, some of the other ones, systems design engineering at close to 1,000, chemical engineering at uh, closer to 950, and then management science is our smallest uh, department at uh, 385. And our School of Architecture had close to 450 students. Next slide, please. So this is just to give you a sense of the undergraduate admissions by final average, and I think it really speaks to uh, that Waterloo Engineering continues to be a very competitive place to get into um, and that it continues to be a destination of choice. And I can say I just saw the numbers for fall 21. Um, again, very, very competitive in terms of the pool of people. And we were just at about 105. We're just about 5% over our target for admissions. So they've done a wonderful, admissions has done a wonderful job for this fall term. But you can see the trends over time from 2009 through to 2019. Um, and again, the grayscales are really all those students that have greater than 95% averages. Now I know when I was, an under, when I was a high school student, there was, I was nowhere near 95%, so I'm so pleased that I did my engineering degree uh, in the mid 80s and not uh, today. Uh, but you can see how strong our students are academically. And you know, they're so strong, and this is part of the reason that continues to drive us being one of the top uh, engineering programs in the entire world. Next slide, please. One of the key things we're always looking at is around diversity in engineering. And we've had a focus uh, for probably over a decade now around women in engineering. How do we make sure that we can uh, encourage and attract more women to consider studying engineering at Waterloo? So this just gives you a sense of the, the, the percentage of women in our first year enrollment in 2020. We'll see what the 21 fall numbers look like soon. Um, but you can see kind of uh, where, some of the where some of the programs have increased. Architectural engineering is our newest engineering program as a collaboration between our civil and environmental engineering program and our School of Architecture. And you can see this is a very attractive program to women, 65%, followed by biomedical engineering again, 60%. Uh, so many of these programs have gone up on the lower end of the spectrum. And ones that we're really focusing on are things like computer engineering, electrical engineering, software engineering, uh, mechatronic engineering, and I think that's all of them. There's five of them that I keep my eye on all the time, software engineering. Uh, although we are at the average in terms of the, the nation, uh, these are the programs that are some of our largest programs and really are the people that go out to uh, go into the tech sector. How can we increase representation of women uh, into these programs? Overall, if we were to look at uh, our overall percentage of women in engineering, it's just over 30%. We're one of the leaders in the country. There's only a couple of other universities that have achieved this as well, including uh, UBC and U of T. So we're doing very, very well, but we can't take our eye off the ball yet. And we continue to focus on uh, making Waterloo Engineering uh, a place where everybody feels like they belong. Next slide, please. 
One of the characteristics and defining features of Waterloo is it is considered the top entrepreneurial university in Canada. This is based on uh, metrics through uh, something called PitchBook and things like that. Um, part of how do they assess what are the top entrepreneurial schools or universities um, is due to the number of billion dollar private companies that are created by students and alumni from Waterloo. Um, it's ranked number two in terms of the amount of capital raised by top, the top five companies founded by our alumni. And it's ranked number one for most venture capital backed student entrepreneurs. So we have that culture. As a result, we attract students that are really interested in entrepreneurship. And again, our close relationship with Conrad uh, allows for us to provide those kinds of opportunities for our students that are interested in taking their new engineering mindset and going off and starting their own company. Next slide, please. In terms of the Waterloo Court, uh, Toronto Corridor, uh, this is kind of the largest concentration of technology companies and startups activity in Canada. If we think about Waterloo Engineering and its history, we have about 700 plus startups that have been founded by a Waterloo engineer. This includes our alumni, our professors, our staff, and our students, where at least one of the founders is from Waterloo Engineering. Now, not all the 700 uh, companies or startups are in the Waterloo Toronto Corridor, but Waterloo Engineering continues to power this corridor through our talent, our research, and our entrepreneurs. Next slide, please. We talked about rankings a little bit earlier. We are ranked top 50 in the world, and we continue to hold that place and one of the top in Canada. Uh, we have, just to give you some kind of facts and figures, we have 25 Canada research chairs, 17 university research and endowed chairs, eight industrial research chairs, and in terms of our uh, external research funding, um, it's close to $87 million. All of these are signs of a vibrant and research intensive university and are critical in order to maintain our place as one of the top 50 in the world. In terms of the new faculty we're bringing in, they're just exceptional. And part of the measure for this is looking at the number of awards they're starting to win themselves very early on in their career. So for example, we have 57 early researcher award recipients. So that's just amazing. And we have about 100, 1,000 industry partners. So we continue to be one of, I would say, the most industry engaged and relevant engineering program in the country. Next slide, please. Just to give you a sense of our research and the kinds of things we're doing, we've already talked a little bit about the research, um, the sponsored, uh, the, sorry, the sponsored research funds. We have signature strengths, one of them being automotive. Uh, we have about 110 uh, automotive researchers. That's the most in Canada, and this manifests itself through uh, one of our centers, which is called WATCAR, which is our Waterloo Center for Automotive Research. And so we really run the largest automotive research program in the country, and it's something that we're very proud of and continue to lead the way. In fact, we, uh, for those of you that hopefully will visit us to campus soon, we now have an autonomous uh, shuttle bus that goes around Ring Road, and I'm really looking forward to doing it. It's a self-driving uh, bus that we've got here, and it will be starting to run in the fall. Part of this, the attraction for Waterloo for our researchers is that uh, you own your own ideas, so your work is your property. So 100% of the ideas developed at Waterloo are owned by their creators. And then 25 million in NSERC awards, these are the federal government awards. Next slide, please. This just gives a sense of the research clusters and signature strengths. We've talked about a few of them. I just wanna highlight a couple that I think are gonna be increasingly important as we come out of this pandemic. I think the whole area of health, health engineering, the nexus between health, technology, and people will be a focus area. And we've seen the government already make some signals that they're gonna be putting significant funding towards this, uh, considering the fact that uh, we really got caught short in terms of not being able to, as a country, manufacture our, our own vaccine. So I think the whole area of bioinnovation will become quite large. The other area I think that's gonna be quite important is the area of robotics, autonomous systems, um, and the, again, interface between robotics and people. Um, people as they age, uh, people, as they, you know, inter people as they interact more and more with robotics. Next slide, please. I just want to highlight a couple of new initiatives um, uh, that I'm very, very proud of that we've started during the pandemic. The first one is something that we've called the IBET PhD project. This, is, this was launched uh, in January as a bold collaboration with some of our neighboring universities, McMaster, the University of Ottawa, Queen's, University of Toronto and Western as a way for us to collaborate and offer pathways for Indigenous and Black students to achieve a PhD in engineering and technology. 
So, uh, for example, myself as Dean at Waterloo Engineering, I've committed a million dollars to fund this. And really, we're providing fellowships, what we're calling IBET uh, PhD fellowships, for these students to be able to complete a PhD. So we've each agreed at these universities to fund two students per year, two new students per year over the next five years, which will provide 10 students at the end of the year. Why do we do this? Because we see that we have so low, such low representation of indigenous students in our engineering programs, as well as black students in our engineering programs. We also see in our faculty, we don't have many indigenous or black faculty members. In fact, at Waterloo, we only have one black faculty member in chemical engineering. And as far as I know, we don't have any indigenous faculty members. So this provides a pipeline for us as well as we think about diversifying our faculty complement into the future. The other initiative I'm very, very proud of is something called, we've called HiveMind. It was launched in January 2021, and it's really a free tutoring service for physics, calculus, and chemistry for high school students who are struggling during the pandemic. We know that the pandemic has had unequal effects on uh, di people differently, depending on your socioeconomic status, depending on your gender. And so we really wanted to do what we could do to help out. Uh, we don't want you know, capable students dropping out of the pipeline and feeling they can't do it just because remote learning isn't working for them. Uh, we've had tremendous uptake of this. Um, I think 150 people have signed up and they've had 350 sessions. So it's something we will continue. And the school boards have just said it's exactly what they need right now. Next slide, please. I think this is my last, pretty much close to my last slide, but in terms of faculty updates, we did do, an, uh, we've developed a new equity fund and it was launched last year on Giving Tuesday, last December. Um, we have had a change to our associate dean outreach, equity and diversity portfolio. In fact, we expanded it from just associate dean outreach to include the equity and diversity under it. Mary Robinson, a professor in chemical engineering is the first holder of that portfolio. We have also established a new chair that was established by alumnus David Cornfield to honor George Sulis, one of the founding faculty of systems design. And we have new department chairs in mechanical and mechatronics uh, engineering. Professor Mike Collins started in that role effective January 1st. And chemical engineering professor Marios Ionidis will be starting as the new chair of chemical engineering effective July 1st in 2021. Next slide, please. I think that's it for me. So thank you so much for listening to me. And I'm just gonna introduce our next speaker now. Uh, it now gives me great pleasure to introduce one of the most popular professors and speakers ever to grace a lectern. He is renowned for his teaching prowess, his TED talk, his best-selling books, and of course, for his deep insight on the challenges facing society. Please welcome the incomparable Larry Smith. Thank you very much, Mary. It is certainly my pleasure to join you at this reunion. I wished we were able to do it in person, but that's not possible safely. So this is an event that I still will enjoy. And I want to, again, express my pleasure at being here. I look forward to an opportunity, though, when we can do this in person. So I get to talk about my favorite subject. I get to talk about the economy, which is endlessly fascinating to me, always changing, and of course occasionally apocalyptic as it is during these moments. Well, it really gives me great satisfaction to be able to bring some positive news, because I can't always do that if I'm going to do it legitimately. One of the things I can start to tell you is, assuming there is no variant that is so peculiar it overrides the vaccination rates, so long as the vaccination rates continue at their current pace, which for, for, na for now is actually really one of the best in the world, so long as we can maintain this, we're going to have a revival of economic activity and the recession will come to a relatively quick close. And that is really positive news. Let's understand why we expect a sharp snapback in economic activity, in fact, faster than would normally occur as we move out of a recession. Recessions in the past, and this is the fifth one I've now taught through, these recessions in the past typically involve some kind of financial marketplace, uh, either fiasco or actual direct action by the Bank of Canada. And for frequently for the public, this makes them uneasy, makes them concerned that they, that they don't understand what's happening. So economic activity tends to revive slowly as people's confidence comes back. This is different. People understand why there's economic adversity. They understand why people have been rendered unemployed in restaurants because we can't actually go there. 
This means people understand that as the vaccination rate continues, and as we can go back to some semblance of normal, that, there sh that in fact there's no reason not to spend money. And so the confidence that underlies all economic activity, both that of investors and consumers, is in, real, is in relatively good shape. So like, we're really pleased that that, is, that that is the circumstance. It's one of these little bonus things that we actually take advantage of. The other element that is really important is, while there was a significant hit in employment, and employment levels fell among, in, in particularly among many people whose incomes weren't very bit good to begin with, in, in service sector jobs not normally offering high salaries. This disadvantaged a n number of our most vulnerable citizens. This is unhelpful to say the least, except of course we must also notice truthfully that the majority of the population continued to work. We worked, re home from, we worked from home and we actually earned incomes. And we had a real challenge for those of us who are still working, earning incomes. What can we do with this money? So, since we have preached that people should save more money, that we actually did save more money. The savings rent rate pre-pandemic was running at about 2%. It's now, over, it's now approximately 13%. Working Canadians poured vast amounts of money into their savings accounts. If there was ever a case of pent-up consumer demand, it's now. People want to spend money. They want to go back to the restaurants. They want to travel. They want to do a whole bunch of things that they have not otherwise done before. They want to get properly barbered, which as you can plainly see, I am not. So we are going to spend money. We have the money to spend. The employment levels, as I say, are still relatively high. So there's going to be a rapid acceleration of economic activity as the vaccinations uh, continue as we move through the year. That is really clear. There is no argument. There's, that's virtually a consensus argument of most economists to expect a sharp ac a resumption of economic activity. Right now, we're about 2% below our uh, uh, previous high. So we've got to gain back that uh, 2%. That is expected to occur over the next uh, year. So that's, that's all good stuff. Yeah, uh, uh, ladies and gentlemen, it's all good stuff. But you know, the butts are coming now. Now, of course, a ex sharp acceleration of consumer activity and spending. That's good. Rising employment, uh, especially among the service sector workers that have uh, been in closed industries, that's going to rise sharply. All of this is really good stuff. And then, of course, is the interesting question. What is going to happen to inflation? Remember inflation? I know some of the, I know some of the people on this, on, in this event. They are not young people, so they actually remember that there was something once upon a time called inflation. A big chunk of my career, inflation was a continuous, controversial, important theme because it was so prevalent and because it was very high and it was socially and economically disadvantageous. Now, for about the past decade, inflation was low and stable, so basically inflation went away. And it didn't occur even though there was a dramatic expansion of the money supply uh, in, the, in 08, 09 to deal with that particular fiasco. And notwithstanding the fact that interest rates are very, very low, and they're low for very good reasons, which we'll talk about in a moment, is there going to be a spike up of inflation? Well, let's see. A lot of savings, a lot of pent-up demand, so bottle, bottlenecks already in the supply chains. So we already see disruption in the supply chain, which have caused, for, among other things, commodity prices to rise sharply. And some of those commodity prices also rising sharply in anticipation of the surge in demand. This means, for example, Canada's exports by value are actually in really relatively healthy shape as commodity prices have strengthened, including for, uh, uh, for lumber, for anyone who, in a renovation frenzy, bought every piece of available wood in the country. There's like no wood available. So if you've got wood, hold on to it, because someone is about to steal it if you're not careful. Like really and truly, to make wood this precious ingredient is really a quite interesting circumstance. But that, now, that, is that a harbinger of a general increase in inflation? The answer is almost certainly yes. The Bank of Canada, for example, which obsesses about these issues, has already acknowledged that they're likely to overshoot the target. The, uh, the long-established target for inflation is Canada is, a, is, is uh, it stripped out of its volatile uh, measurements, uh, including, among other things, energy is between 1% and 3%. And the bank effectively drives it around 2%. 2% they're happy with, 2% per year inflation. Now, they expect, in fact, it to increase 
as an almost inevitable circumstance of this sharp and relatively sudden increase in economic activity. So it hit two and two, two, it could actually hit the top of the boundary, which is 3%. It might even get over 3%. The bank has been fairly clear that they will not immediately react to what they assume is going to be a, tech, a temporary increase, a temporary increase in the rate of inflation. So if it is a temporary increase in inflation, the Bank of Canada said it will, not, it will not engage in particular policy actions. So basically it's telling you that it expects the increase in inflation to be temporary, they will tolerate it, and interest rates will remain relatively low. Hmm. That of course had an if in it, did it not? If it remains stable, if it, sorry, if it uh, is a temporary spike up in inflation. But what if one year from now, Inflation is riding consistently over 3% here and possibly elsewhere, since similar conditions exist in the United States for something in similar direction. Oh, well, interest rates might start rising significantly. And the bank has been very clear. It has reminded you, in case you've forgotten, and if you're a former student of mine, you shouldn't have forgotten, because you should know this already. He said... I, sorry, I couldn't resist saying that, ladies and gentlemen. I just had to say that. Sometimes, sometimes the old professor wants to say, I told you so. I told you that the Bank of Canada has the tools to contain inflation. I told you that in 81. I told you that in 91. I told you that in 2001. And I will tell you that yet again. And the bank's been very clear. It said, and by the way, if inflation is, uh, does not, if it's, if it's more than that temporary spike up, we have the tools to rein it in. And you know perfectly well what those tools are to increase interest rates. Hmm. So are the odds of that happening? Well, we don't know because we're in an unprecedented situation, but the tools are available. And I would remind you, in case you've also forgotten, the Bank of Canada is not an agency of the government of Canada and therefore does not, <coughs> has not, under the modern legislation which is in place, has never, had, has never been given an instruction by the government of Canada. So in fact, this is in many ways a non-political decision. It's a technical decision. So that raises the likelihood or the possibility that should it be necessary, it will happen. Now, since it's impossible actually to tell you the odds of it happening or not, most of the consensus is not likely that the inflation is going to abate quickly as the supply chains pick up speed again. This is always assuming no disruption in the supply chains caused by a resurgent of the virus in, in the major manufacturing countries of the, of the world. So assuming all that, which is assumed, so unless there are some, some biological scares coming, that inflation is probably temporary. But it does, come, does bring us to this topic of the potential course of interest rates, which remain at this moment at 400 year lows. That forecast I just gave you about a rapid snapback in economic activity assumes also two other things besides the vaccinations are working. It assumes no giant bust up in the financial markets and no bust up in the real estate markets. So what is the course of the possibilities involving the stock market and the real estate market? Come on, ladies and gentlemen, don't try to fool the old guy. This is what you really want to know about. You want to know about whether your house value is at risk. You want to know if you're young and don't have a house yet, if there's a prayer of you ever owning your own home. And if you're, a, if you're an older person and have a, has a registered retirement savings plan, you also wonder about those plans which K K include large amounts of Canadian and uh, international equities whether your retirement, your retirement is at risk. Now, of course, all those wonderful spending plans that you have, all those restaurants, all those trips, all that stuff you think you want to take and I want to take. I have a four, I have a four wheeler ATV side by side sitting in the yard waiting for me to get home to use it. So yes, I bought a toy. I bought an expensive toy because I also had savings and didn't know what to do with it. So thought, I went, so thought I would buy myself a toy to drive around in the forest. And I can't wait to use it, and it's just new, and I haven't used it yet. But what will derail those plans? Oh, yes, ladies and gentlemen. You suddenly thinking your house is at risk. You suddenly thinking, 
my goodness, I have a mortgage which is higher <clears throat> than today's value of my house. You will do what you have done in the past when such odd circumstances occur. You dramatically reduce all other forms of spending. So now we have to pause for a moment and answer one really interesting question. Is the real estate market a big bubble? And is the stock market a really big bubble? Stock markets have come back slightly, but they're still very high by historic standards. And they have risen through most of the pandemic. There was a little bump and then they kept rising. They've been rising for a long period of time. Stock prices are relatively high historically. And house prices, well, really, shall we talk about house prices? That leap 10, 20, 30, depends which marketplace you're in, 10, 20, 30% per year. Now, first thing that we're going to say about the housing market, because we need to talk about that in more detail, because a bust up there will derail this uh, forecast. A bust up there, <laughs> excuse me. First, we're talking about a bust up, not the fact that, it, that those price increases have to slow. It's mathematically impossible, by the way. You can't have host prices right 20% per year, per year, per year. Your engineers do the math. You know that's bizarre. And so, so the only question is, when is it going to plateau and do something that is mathematically not impossible? And if it plateaus, will it just mm, go steady? That will be okay. No, most, most people won't freak out if that's happening. But on the other hand, what if it pulls back? Oh, one or two percent. I think people will be calm with that. And more, and more. Now, notice a few things about would that ha what's the odds of that happening? What's the likelihood of that happening? Well, partly, it's important to notice that while the prices have risen at extraordinary rates, Part of that increase is actually very easy to understand. Bubbles tend to occur for mysterious reasons. We'll get to the stock market and Robin Hood in a moment, so just let's do things in order, ladies. I know how you in class used to leap to new topics before we finish the one we're on. Let's deal with the real estate market before we worry about the craziness in the stock markets. In the real estate market, much of that's driven by real, real reasons. So, for example, Employment levels in this country are some of the highest in the world. When people get jobs, they tend to want houses. Much of the employment in this country is still relatively well paid and consistent with, of course, interest rates being so low, it was in fact possible for large numbers of people to want to buy homes. So there was a real driver of demand. Yes, right now, there's a significant amount of speculative investment where people are buying uh, uh, condos, for example, and houses and renting them and proposing to flip them. Well, the point is, of course, they're still able to rent them because there's someone who also needs accommodation. We have a relatively rapid increase in our population because of the fact that we have, although being disrupted by the pandemic, a significant in inflow of immigration. So the number of people working rises sharply. The number of people coming into the country has risen historically at reasonably good rates. This means that the demand for housing is relatively strong, like real people with real jobs wanting to buy real houses. <clears throat> so, th so that's fine. Oh, the other element of what's driven those prices up is that's a, that's a real increase in demand, but increasing the supply of housing is not easy to do. Housing is, by definition, something that responds more slowly to changes in demand. It's affected by public policies, it's affected by municipal governments, it's affected by a whole range of considerations. Now, some of those considerations are totally valid. Let us not destroy the environment by building houses every, <laughs> every place under the sun. On the other hand, some of them may be driven by artificial barriers, which are slowing down, for example, in the in innovation in the, in the construction industry for housing, which would be unhelpful. So there are a number of issues which cause the the, the, the supply to grow much more slowly. And then it's economics 101. If the demand is rising sharply and supply is, is, is rising slowly, then you are going to have this, this, this price spike up. There's another element that is adding to this aggravation of, of the um, increase in the housing prices. And that, of course, is the fact that the population is concentrating itself in a very, very small part of this. We're a massive country. But for some bizarre reason, we all decide we have to live on top of each other. So much of the employment is occurring in, depends on how you want to, how you want to count an urban jurisdiction in three to four single jurisdictions in the country. 
having to be spread also around the country, but doesn't change the fact that if there's there's a surge of employment, for example, in um, in Vancouver, that and Vancouver in the area, that by the way is a hard place to find appropriate land for housing for a very bunch of good reasons, as you know perfectly well. An abnormal proportion of jobs are created in a very very few number of cities in a very very in a very, very concentrated area. So naturally, that's also driven up the price of housing abnormally. But those are real circumstances, and they're not about to be abate quickly. Certainly working remotely from home has caused people to leave, for example, some of these urban areas and seek more affordable housing in communities elsewhere. And that, of course, has driven up housing prices more generally. And of course, the Waterloo region, if we just talk about this particular, uh, this particular community, whose housing prices are up 20 to 30 percent, depending which benchmark you're using, uh, the employment growth rates have been very strong. We have, we have significant uh, employment creation from both established companies and the new entrepreneurial companies that Mary referred to. So in fact, that's again, valid market. Most of those houses are, are, are occupied and most of the condos are occupied or by owners or renters. So, so long as the underdi underlying dynamic remains that strong, then that's a good thing. What would destabilize this, of course, is back to inflation. If the inflation was sustained a year from now and interest rates rise, for some people who are carrying large mortgages, that may spook them. For people who are the wheelers, the dealers and the flippers, of which there's a considerable number out there, they are, they, they are driven, they're powerfully vulnerable to that increase in interest rates. So that potential increase in interest rates driven by a spike up of inflation is the one thing that could bring the housing market at least very quickly to a plateau and possibly cause it to abate somewhat. So there is a significant risk, but it all comes back down to inflation. Isn't it so, I mean, it's so cool how it all fits together. Like, I love this stuff. I'm sorry if it sounds like I'm getting so excited by the fact that there's all this doom and gloom and so many people have lost their jobs, and I'm not. But intellectually, this is fascinating to see how these pieces come together. <clears throat> Whatever is going on, ladies and gentlemen, it is not out of control. It is not un impossible to understand. So whatever you want to think about your economy, do not suddenly believe it is so complicated you can't understand it or it's a bunch of random noise. It's neither of those two things. You can advantage yourself by planning carefully, mindful of the fact that you've got to, be, you've got to deal with contingencies. You live in a world that is, is about contingencies and if you want to live in an entirely predictable world, my goodness, you want to live in a world with no technology, which would be an odd thing for an engineer to think he or she wanted to do. Never mind anybody else. So we're going to have to live with these levels of uncertainty. We've got to plan for those levels of uncertainty. And the real estate market has these dimensions, which is fairly clear, driven by interest rates. And then we come to the stock market. Haven't forgotten about the stock market. Those of you, oh, oh yes, yes. Ladies and gentlemen, here, I'm trying to be calm. You know, it's always a struggle for me to stay calm while I'm talking about the economy. And when you do, do dopey things, it makes me even more difficult to stay calm. There is something about technically literate people, especially when they are technically literate with respect to information technology, that seems to make you pray to anything that is really technical, really cool tech, to make you think it is, it must thrive. It must thrive. Like, mustn't it? I mean, isn't, isn't, isn't it the case that cool is the greatest compliment that you can pay to anybody? to any company and to any product, anything. I'm a student of language, by the way. I happen to like language. Cool is one of those youth-oriented words which has not changed in almost 75 years. Cool means today what it meant when I was an undergraduate in this institution. It's likely to mean the same thing 50 years forward. It's one of these odd words. Most of the other, you know, idiosyncratic words, slang of my childhood now are either unintelligible to you or might be <clears throat> rude, but not cool. The only trouble is, ladies and gentlemen, please explain to me how cool is the same thing as a profitable, worthy investment which has understandable risk.
For though you know what I'm oh now see if you were in this room I could see your faces and I would know you've got this who look on who me look on your face yes you I'm talking to you you who hold bitcoins you you who hold oh and Bitcoin I mean, some of you of course believe Bitcoin is like so stupid because Ethereum is the true religion it's the cryptocurrency that will rule them all yo, yo see my goodness even the camera technician thinks. Um, uh -huh. Yes, okay, well, wait till I finish talking about cryptocurrencies. Ladies and gentlemen, can you make money with cryptocurrency? Of course you can. Of course you can. You can make money buying, buying and selling gold. You can make money buying speculative investments. You can make money buying and selling vague claims to images auctioned off by Christie's. You know, punk art indeed. Ladies and gentlemen, I know about this stuff. And in your hearts, you know too. In your hearts, you know, it is a royally speculative investment. And cryptocurrency is valuable because large numbers of people think it's valuable for the same reason gold is valuable. And of course, because something is valued solely between your ears, driven by no objective reality whatsoever, you know perfectly well that that can change. It is why Bitcoin and its equivalents are so volatile. Hmm. Now, I would like to think if it was just the cryptocurrencies that were in fantasy land, if I, I'd like to think that, hmm, but it's not. By the way, for those of you who think, well, yeah, but cryptocurrencies are going to finally become real currencies and drive out nasty government-issued money. Really? Well, in the first place, by the way, notice the government can simply prohibit all this activity. Please notice that China has already been making noises that it's about to do so. But more to the point is... Yes, cryptocurrencies, yes, it's quite true, cryptocurrencies could become currency. And they are actually becoming currency. So then that means they're real. If they're becoming currency, then that's a real economic function, and therefore they might have value. And you know perfectly well who's using them. While you invest in cryptocurrency, you are facilitating organized crime, ransomware, and the hacker world. Now, if you really believe the governments of the world will not take any action in the pr on the concerning the primary payment mechanism for organized crime, and in particular for the hacker ransomware, which is bedeviling us at this moment, if you really believe that governments will not take action to reduce the ability of criminals to launder their illegal proceeds, Oh my goodness, you're alumni, you are mature men and women. That would fall under the category of naive. Please don't be naive about the power of the state. There are already elaborate mechanisms to prevent money, real money, from being used for criminal activity. Would you really suppose that anyone let cryptocurrencies serve that function. And there are a number of tools that they could use to prevent it. So, warning, warning. Danger, danger. Speculate if you wish. And if you've made some money, and you might have, do what all good poker players do. Take some of your earnings, take them out of the game, take them out of the game fast, because if you're not taking them out of the game fast and putting them into something real, your $7.2 million worth of cryptocurrency that you have at this moment could become zero, like literally zero. Now, I would like to tell you that the stock market itself is not like that. I mean, stocks and real companies, that's not the same thing as cryptocurrency. So, okay, fine, fine. Cryptocurrency, you've got your <laughs> retirement funds in cryptocurrency. I despair. And most of you don't, thank goodness. But what about the stock market itself? At very, very high price, notice a few things. The stock market indexes are abnormally affected by a relatively small number of companies who've done spectacularly well. Some of them are real companies making real products and making them profitably. Google would be one. Amazon makes marginal profits, but it's sitting on its cloud unit which is very profitable to it. Facebook's a real company, selling ads very profitably. 
That's real. But the evaluations of many companies bear no relationship to what it is they're actually doing. So some of the big ones I mentioned, okay, they're, they're reasonable. And as soon as Amazon becomes a true monopoly, they, of course, will raise their prices, even though the government of the United States has the ability to prohibit that. So if you're buying Amazon to wait for it to be the full monopoly and pump up its prices, what if it can't? What if it can't? Small little complication in this party we're having while dancing on our RSP returns. Then notice the other thing. Notice the stocks whose underlying reality bear no relationship to the price. I can think of an electric car company that comes to mind making a handful of call cars, hmm, even profitably, it's a handful of cars in the marketplace. And look at the numbers. You're men and women of numbers. That's why Mary reports numbers to you. You should be able to react to numbers. You should think, yeah, numbers are good. Well, I'll tell you numbers are good too. I'm an economist after all. What would you think I'm going to say? I'm going to tell you, with respect to some of these companies, pray look at the numbers. You know when there's something strange going on. When children are trading stocks. Yes, they are. Teenagers. I'm sorry. Those are children. We've got now children taking positions on stock prices. So BlackBerry. BlackBerry has connections back to the University of Waterloo. As well as, as, so, well, so we pay attention to that. Now, now ladies and gentlemen. Blackberry's prices have been rising and falling at like ridiculous rates over the past week. Up 10%, down 10%. Nothing is materially happening at Blackberry. It's not announcing products. It's not announcing bad news. It's not announcing good news. It's not announcing any news at all. Not because it's not active, but it's, it's you know, it is, is rebuilding itself. It's trying to develop a new, mar a new marketplaces, which is all good stuff. But the volatility in the stock price now has absolutely nothing to do with the fact, except that it has attracted that commentary in social media. Now, for those of you who are m m men and women of numbers, pay attention to the social media. Is the social media actually giving you numbers? Oh, I have a secret numbers about BlackBerry. No, they're just saying, BlackBerry, cool. That's what they are saying. Now, they use a lot of synonyms for cool. Well, half the words are cool and then the other half words are not cool. Like really, really and truly, ladies and gentlemen, does that sound like a sophisticated way to buy stocks? So unfortunately, there's a lot of noise in the stock market of all the amateurs, children, day traders, facilitated by, oh yes, facilitated by the technology you so love. Oh yes. Don't you in your heart of hearts feel slightly uneasy, just slightly uneasy, that people now whip out their phone to make important financial decisions on that teeny tiny screen where you can barely see what you're looking at. Not the environment that will offer numbers. With my old eyes, I can't see a list of table numbers on my phone anyway. And I would like to think that a young person can actually see the numbers, but they don't actually look at the numbers anyways. They're on their phone reading up log, a blog posting of a you know the word, it's so cool, influencers. Influencers. I'm a university professor and I'm proud of it. I want you to be looking, to be reading what <clears throat> experts tell you. You know, experts, people who've worked in a domain, people who have reputation and track record and experience trying to talk to you about stocks, investment opportunities or other areas. And we'd like you to, you know, experts, but apparently you're influenced by people who are called influencers. It's a wonderful word because it's a true word. It's a true word. They influence your behavior for no apparent reason except they can do really great video. Warning, warning, danger, danger. The marketplaces, the financial market for equities, the stock markets, are at risk because of all of this bumping and grinding and noise and children and amateurs and day traders. So work the numbers. I'm not telling you not to invest, that's ridiculous. Of course you should. 
You should save and spend a little money and save and invest. Invest carefully. Invest in things you do homework for. Homework. Homework on a real screen where you can read things from experts, not amateurs. Make wise decisions. I'm going to say it. It's the word you don't like. You didn't like it when you were in these buildings. You don't like it now. Do your homework. Or in these tumultuous, dangerous times in which we live, failure to do homework will produce more than a failed course. It'll set you on fire. Don't do that, ladies and gentlemen. We have this opportunity of a resurging economic activity, and we need it. We need to bring those parts of our population which are economically struggling. We need to bring them forward. We need to include them in economic activity. We most certainly do. Initiative and diversity will not work if the economy is tanking. So we've got, we've got this positive momentum. We're getting the pandemic behind us, blessedly. Now's the time not to lose your wits. Now is not the time to think, must double down on hysterical investments with no value to them. Warning, waning. Warning, danger, danger. Please do not do that. So my cautionary note is not because there's apocalypse. My cautionary note is you could damage yourselves by too critically adopting the modern way of doing things. You know what it is. At the risk of yet one more stupid techie acronym. Fear of missing out. I better get on my phone and buy something. Because I'll miss the opportunity. Goodness, you, you, listen to what that sounds You sound like you're 12. That's not a good thing for adult persons. Some of whom may be moving to the peak of their careers. Please, please don't do that. Now, we have to address one point, and I want to take a just brief look a little farther into the economy, and then I'm going to be happy to take questions. One thing I want to say is, please, while you are trying to understand these financial market issues, would you please at least not pray fall, fall prey to some of the goofy mythology out there you're supposed to know better. So, let's go through some of the things that could affect the financial markets that some of you may have, in a moment of weakness, been tempted to believe. One, Canada is not broke. Yes, your government spent a very large amount of money. Could it have spent a little less? Yes, possibly. Except when you're in the middle of a crisis, it's a little hard to not overdo it. Because there's always the criticism that you underdid it. So you face a crisis. The economies hit the rocks. It's a public health emergency. It's an economic emergency. Do what the textbooks say. Spend money. Government spends money. Bank of Canada creates the money to facilitate it so interest rates don't rise. It is exactly out of the economic textbooks, and it's been used repeatedly. So don't suddenly then look at it, see a big number, and go goofy. You're supposed to understand numbers, not say, yo, there's a lot of digits and somehow come to that as a realistic conclusion about something. Yes, it's a lot of digits. The truth is the government of Canada's debt, total debt position is not disproportionate to, to most of its neighbors. Its ability to service its debt is easily under control. The simple fact of the, simple fact of the matter is, yes, they could, and I'm not justifying the, whether they spent it all wisely. They sent me some money. What on earth were they spending, sending me money for? Because I have money. I don't need to have these little bonuses sent by the government of Canada. So that was just generally goofy. But the truth is, fundamentally, they did what they were supposed to. They could, have, they could have finessed it more. But again, sometimes in hindsight, that's how you do it. The current fiscal plan of the government of Canada is credible. Now, they have to follow through. The, the spending is unsustainable, but they know that. Everyone knows that. So they, they propose not to sustain it as the emergency abates. As the emergency abates, the spending should abate. The debt levels are not disproportionately high. And so, if you do what you're supposed to do, 
Let it obey. Oh, by the way, and then the other cliche, if, oh, please, don't, don't, don't suddenly leap into this, this cliche that, oh, yeah, well, you know, they're borrowing money and all the young people are going to have to pay it off. We haven't paid off World War II. Why on earth would we suddenly pay off the money we borrowed yesterday afternoon? We don't pay it off. We simply roll it over and roll it over and the economy grows and it's not an issue. Keep in mind that most, right now, big chunk of the gov government's debt's held by the Bank of Canada, and when it pays interest, it simply goes to the Bank of Canada, then comes back to the government in an accounting loop. So, get rid of that fantasy. Your government needs to restrain the spending. It is a plan to do so. You should hold it to that plan, because it's necessary that that spending be restrained. And it may imply also some tax increases in the future. So if you think the debt is too high, then I presume you're in favor of those tax increases. So do make up your mind with respect to what you want. Ladies and gentlemen, I feel a little silly saying something which should be obvious to all of us who are thoughtful. I pray that's most of you. We need to make decisions carefully. We need to make them the old fashioned way, calmly, not on our phones, with real data, not driven by goofy influencers. We do our homework. It's boring. It works. It finds you opportunities and keeps you from danger. We look to you not just to make wise decisions, decisions for yourselves and your families. We look to you to make decisions wise for your communities. We invite you to provide leadership if you, be, if you respond thoughtfully, the world needs leadership from educated, committed, experienced men and women, and that's you. Please rise to that challenge of providing community leadership. And for engineers in particular, and I know that I'm, I know this is an event for engineers, but I would, I would, say, I would say this to any audience. I'm not catering to you. I would say it's also important to, to provide leadership in those decisions about technology. Most of the major social challenges facing us, including the pandemic, including the potential that further viruses are out there lurking. The answers are in science and technology, and you know that. Our ability to address climate change, which is a horrendous challenge facing us, a potential catastrophic and insidious threat to us all, it is not just going to be solved by recycling cans and driving a little less. It requires technological innovations involving renewable energy, storage, and carbon capture. That's your domain. You want to put your investment dollars where they really will be, be put to good purpose? The weather cryptocurrency, how about the things that will make better lives? for you, your children, and your grandchildren, or your great-grandchildren. We have a responsibility to the young. I spend a bunch of my time with the young. That's why I like talking to you old, mm, old, huh? to your mature alumni people. Huh, I'm older than you are, so I get to say old. You don't, by the way. Surrounded by young techies here. And don't you make old jokes. I can. You can't. But the point is, we are supposed to have the maturity to provide the leadership. We are supposed to care about the children and those yet to be born, then to rise to that responsibility. It's about leadership, informed leadership, and technology is as it has been for so long at the heart of this matter. I don't know whether I'm being optimistic or pessimistic. I'm trying to be practical, I'm trying to be realistic. I have too much respect for you and this opportunity to speak with you to do anything other than tell you how I feel about these issues. I wish us all success in the challenging days that remain ahead of us when the pandemic is hopefully in history, the challenges merely morph 
They have not gone away. I am, of course, tickle pink to answer questions. Again, or I'll start talking more and you'll all be sorry. So I'm happy to have uh, questions. Uh, they're going to be. Um... So we have a question here. What's the future of the co-op program or perhaps new grad uh, jobs when big high tech companies are no longer in Canada? So perhaps touch on the brain drain or the concern of the brain drain. It's clearly an issue. We live in a world in which the most precious thing is talent with, without a doubt, right? Talent is the key issue. We have not always done a good job in Canada of making sure that we can nurture uh, growth. Uh, start, we, can, we can nurture startups. We, we have some trouble making sure that they can scale up in Canada. So it's, it's a real challenge that needs to be addressed, and I, and I will not deny that. Uh, the brain drain is abated slightly as the government of the United States under its previous president, whose name I shall not speak, so great is his shame, and has driven some of the most talented people away. We do need to learn how better to nurture our startups, not into growth, not just to start them. So we're working on, we're actually working on that. So that's, that's an important issue. But I'd also say that one of the ed edges we have in this country, we're a small country, and as a small country, we're vulnerable to large, large players mucking about, sometimes appropriately and sometimes we're collateral damage by accident. But I ask you to notice one interesting thing, that of all the democracies on the planet, a shrinking number, by the way, but of all the mature democracies on this country, we're about to have an election probably within the next year. <clears throat> we are almost the only country that will have that election where immigration is not a contentious political issue. None of Canada's major political parties wish to restrict I I immigration. The, I what they are arguing about is the number of immigrants. And the argument is, oh, that number's not too big. Th that's ar ar uh, the argument is that number's too small. Not that argument's too big. For the past 15 years, almost 20 years now, the vast majority of Canadians have said immigrants are a net positive contribution to the economy, which is why the politicians don't do anything other than say, yes, that's a good thing, because they can read the polls too. That's one of our most favorable circumstances. It is why the, the, the you know, challenges that we've had serving our, our international students because of the travel restrictions and other concerns, you know, is unhelpful doesn't change the fact that we are still one of the most welcoming societies to immigration and that helps address the brain drain because we've got a brain gain there now we need to hold on to them other questions so we have some questions coming in about the housing market yes uh, do you think that the housing market is in a bubble uh, and what can city government do to improve the supply of housing uh, okay first the best I can say about the housing market is it is possibly a bubble in the sense, it's a bubble in the sense that it cannot keep rising at the same rate. So if you're buying a house expecting to, you know, if you buy a house today and you expect it to actually uh, uh, appreciate over the next 10 years, that is certainly almost a wild speculation is almost likely not to occur. If you've had a house from the past, you are likely to have some gains that will be realized. So it's, I, and I'm not trying to waffle, but it's bubble-like. Bubble implies that it, it, once the bubble is pricked, there'll be a, there, a guaranteed sharp reduction. Because those drivers we talked about are so fundamental, there's still a fundamental demand for housing and a fundamental uh, problem with supply. So that while it, the prices can come down, I do not see them falling so sharply as to destabilize the, the uh, housing market. For example, in, the, in, in when we, we, for example, when mortgage rates went more than 10% in the early 80s, there were predictions of massive people um, losing their homes. They actually did not. What ended up happening was that people just paid down their mortgages, stopped spending money on other things, uh, and we had a recession, but people stayed in their homes. 
I was actually talking to someone this afternoon, in fact, who, whose family was able to maneuver through that. So if, 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 they can maneuver, if, you, if people can maneuver through 10% mortgage rates and that 10% is not coming back any time in, in a realistic time frame, then bubble lake is the best way to describe it. There are a variety of things that, the, that uh, municipal governments can do, by the way, to facilitate um, uh, housing within their cities to make sure that available land, including public land, is available for housing. It's also important to recognize that if you're going to have people living in concentrated areas, they have to live in high rises. And people have got to stop complaining about uh, uh, buildings which are too tall overlooking their single detached houses because low density density is, is, is a key issue. Uh, the other thing I would point out is the, Ontario, the building code um, has to be uh, altered so that we can move uh, housing innovation, construction innovations into the system much, much more quickly. There's a whole range of, of construction innovations which could tangibly lower, lower the house of a, price of accommodation of constructing it that are stuck in the pipeline. The challenges, for example, of something simple as what is called tall timber, timber which is laminated wood. Uh, finally, the building code allows you to build a high-rise building uh, with uh, this version of lumber, which by all the scientific evidence is as safe as building it using other materials. Um, and even then, even then, one, a, a company in Toronto was, was going to build tall, um, narrow, tall uh, uh, buildings out of wood uh, and provide affordable, uh, uh, affordable price points. And he was told by the building inspectors that he had to have all the, con all the stairwells concrete, which defeats the whole purpose. You can't bring in concrete workers at all, those, all that expense and then build wood around it. Now, they f a great row occurred. Uh, and they finally decided that, yes, well, if the building itself was safe, then the stairwells could be self and made out of wood. But that you would actually have to, uh, this slowed the developer down. And this happened within the last several years, by the way. So that's, that's also one way, uh, which is a provincial responsibility, by the way. Now, it will also help that building inspections, which are at the municipal level, would also be a little more accommodating than just dealing with the uh, um, detailed rules of the building code. Uh, as, as for those of you in my classroom before, you know when you ask me questions, I can't possibly do short answers. I'm sorry, new question? So we uh, have a question here uh, on climate change. Yes. What are your thoughts on climate change to the current economic system and what should be done right now? Okay, it's an enormous, climate change is an enormous challenge. Look, there are some things we do not understand about, about climate change. I mean, it's, it's a science which is evolving, but I am not going to suddenly decide that I know more about climate change than the people who have been specialists in it. Like, I like experts, and experts tell me that the environment is severely at risk and approaching a tipping point beyond which we will, we will struggle to, to uh, uh, um, you know, mitigate the damage. So th that would be my first observation. So let us be clear, it is something we all have to take serious. It requires us all to make changes to our behavior, changes to what we buy, changes to how we respond to every manner of thing, how we, how we design the buildings that we're in, how we design our own travel plans. So this requires, this is one of these cases where you need virtually every citizen to take positive action. We also need the state to do it. We also need our large corporations to do it. It is somewhat encouraging that more and more investors are holding large organizations up to their environmental uh, responsibilities to say that they will not, for example, invest in companies which are just about extracting and using carbon without any carbon mitigation uh, 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 techniques. So I I what has to be done now is what's being done. It's like a full court press. You need to take all of these sensible initiatives and push them all forward and stop being content that you recycle your pop cans. One of the challenges is people People get satisfied by doing some, you know, simple things. I mean, it's a good simple thing. Well, you, well you, you certainly should recycle aluminum, but it doesn't change the fact that that is not going to stop the polar ice caps from melting because they're melting right now. Like, it is scary to me. I'm, I'm, I'm a, a, a tree hugger. My family has 15,000 trees and we love every single one of them, except, of course, the ones we're cutting down for lumber. And that we do in a sustainable fashion. So the, the, my family takes pride in the fact that it's forced is not cut at sustainable yield, and is now more, bio, uh, more biodiverse, and has more, effectively we, we are capturing carbon, because we have more trees and fewer trees, and the trees are growing, and we're harvesting uh, l less than we actually take in, a way that we can actually offset some of the carbon use by the farm. So, but, but 
all, uh, that just needs to continue. It needs to be doubled down by other, uh, other people. There is no quick, easy answer. Just take action now uh, across a whole range of fronts. So now, I'm sorry if someone's looking for a silver bullet. They do not exist for so complex and important an issue. Other questions? Um, so we have a question asking, when do you think the market will start destabilizing for a possible crash? The and stock market, I presume, yes. is referring to. <sighs> the stock market is quite different from the housing market. The stock market traditionally is much, is much more volatile. It is, can leap up and down by very large amounts. Thus, because the prices are relatively high, and because some of the prices are driven by, as I said, unwise short-term decision makers, what I can certainly say is it is going to be, and I'm sorry if this sounds like a waffle, but I'm not going to mix stuff up, it is going to be unpredictably volatile. So, you know, if, if, if I could give you the timing, I would. Well, after I taken my own stock position to profit insanely from the information. I can't tell you that, but I can tell you to be cautious. I can tell you, you know, the old virtues work. It's really so boring that we have to say the old virtues work. You're engineers. You should know that, you know, we don't repeal the law of gravity. Like things you got to do are the same. And one of the things is that everyone tells you and you should do it. You just don't want, want to do it. I've known more than one engineer who bitches about the law of gravity because it's slowing down the design they want to make. Yeah, well, I'm sorry about that, but you've got to live with the world you, you're in. And the, in, in the, the, the advice for investment is very clear. Trying to get timing so you can profit from the timing is almost impossible. So do what you're supposed to do, which is diversify your risks to make sure you have a wide variety of things. Wide variety of investment categories, uh, some debt, some equity. And yes, you know, the truth is, a small amount, a small amount, I'm looking at someone now, of Bitcoin would be reasonable because it's, it's diversified risk. Other questions? All right, we have time for one more question. Mm -hmm. So the last question um, is, it sounds like you agree there is a very large opportunity for technology. How does this opportunity compare to decades past? Well, I'd actually change that to say Yes, I see huge opportunities for technology, but I would actually say I have huge, I see a urgent, growing, critical need for strategic innovations, technical innovations to be created across a wide range of circumstances. From simple things, assuring that the planet has clean water, that it has an adequate and nutritious food supply. Technology also is needed to make sure we rein in the dark web which is a ha haven for criminals of every disgusting kind who are prepared to destabilize economic activity and peddle child pornography and traffic in human beings. Really, we need technology to address that because at the moment they do it with impunity. And that's got to come to an end. There are, as Mary mentioned earlier, enormous opportunities in healthcare and advancements in biological science, which also needs engineering expertise as well. So in, in my mind, there are huge opportunities. With respect to how has it changed over time, I think the needs for technology have become more urgent. I think I see that as changing over time. I see a greater appreciation of, in society of the need to do innovation, which is, of course, a, a, you know, another way to look at technological innovation. It is interesting for me to notice over the, oh my goodness, 40 years that I've been in the classroom, to watch major corporations have, virtually all major corporations have innovation units. Now, sometimes they're innovation only in name, but rhetoric changes before reality changes. So the, at, at least companies now understand that they better innovate or that they cannot survive in the marketplace. Now, that's, that's a change. And that's, for me, a, harbor, a very positive harbinger. Because we, we can't on one hand, we can't on one hand tell the graduates of the University of Waterloo, go forth and be innovators, when all of their employers do not want them to do that. That would hardly, that would hardly, um, that would hardly be useful. Again, I wish us all success in dealing with these extraordinary times. You know, when I was young, 
When I was young, I actually thought to myself, I hope I live in interesting times. I had not heard the aphorism about it. I just, young Larry thought that. Now, I do with less interesting times, to tell you the truth, which is all success. Thank you so much, Larry. Once again, you've given us something to think about. I particularly liked your comments around strategic innovation and, and really thinking about it very thoughtfully in terms of, again, what are the most problem, important problems our world faces? I also want to thank all of you for joining us today in what we hope will be the final virtual reunion and we can all meet up again back on campus in 2022. I know I'm really looking forward to that day and to meeting some of you in person. In the meantime, please enjoy the rest of the programming, which includes our virtual tour video, so you can see how the campus looks today since you can't be here, and a nostalgic photo slideshow. Thank you very much again and enjoy the rest of your day. Welcome to the Faculty of Engineering at the University of Waterloo, the epicenter of technology talent. Waterloo Engineering is Canada's largest engineering school and is ranked among the top 50 worldwide, which is an awesome accomplishment for such a young university. At Waterloo Engineering, we encourage hands-on learning and have created the spaces to ensure everyone has a place to work, play, and learn. From classrooms to labs and student garages to maker spaces and study halls, it's all about empowering students, faculty, and staff to work together to solve some of the world's biggest challenges. Here in Engineering 7, Waterloo Engineering's front door, we are shaping the future of engineering. The Engineering Outreach Team offers a wide range of engineering-based programming to expose Ontario's youngest students to the ideas and excitement of STEM. The RoboHub is a testing and training facility that enables innovative research with a unique fleet of diverse robots. Augmenting this fleet is the RoboHub's high-precision indoor positioning system and a fully equipped control and command center. At Waterloo Engineering, we love our coffee and donuts, served up in our two C&D shops run by the Engineering Society. Everyone comes here, especially the profs, because the coffee is cheap and full of magical caffeine. Hi, Lily. The Engineering Ideas Clinic is where undergrad students work in teams to tackle open-ended problems. In their first few weeks on campus, New students get right to work on design day projects. That's the best way to learn engineering by applying concepts and building things. The Ideas Clinic also has a fully equipped machine shop and a structural frame to test civil engineering principles. This space is networked with other high-tech teaching features in E7, like the sensor bridge on the fifth floor and a weather window on the sixth floor. In E7, you'll also find world-class research labs focused on cybersecurity, biomedical and bionics research, and additive manufacturing. It's also home to the Center for Theoretical Neuroscience and the Brain Lab. The lecture halls are pretty sweet, and so are these student garages that offer lots of space for group work as students prepare for final year capstone design projects. There are plenty of quiet study areas throughout the engineering buildings, like this one here in E7. We have a dedicated space for business pitches for our entrepreneurs, the Margaret and Andrew Stevens Pitch Space. We are the only engineering faculty in the world to have an embedded Master of Business, Entrepreneurship and Technology, the MBET degree, from the Conrad School of Entrepreneurship and Business. E7 is connected to E5, and the Department Offices for Electrical and Computer Engineering, Mechanical and Mechatronics Engineering, and Systems Design Engineering are in these buildings. E5 was uniquely designed to provide many amazing hands-on labs and facilities, like the wood shop, the student machine shop, the paint shop, and the rapid prototyping center. The CEDRA Student Design Center in E5 was created to provide extracurricular student teams with collaborative workspaces. Waterloo students from all faculties are part of competitive teams working in these bays. Teams here are getting ready to compete at a range of events all over the world. Waterloo has many internationally renowned research centers, like CIARS, the Center for Intelligent Antenna Radio Systems. CIARS labs offer one of the highest precision and widest frequency range environments for microwave terahertz testing in North America. The Real-Time Embedded Software Group, the Emerging Radio Systems Group, the Center for Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence, and many more advanced research facilities are all located here in E5. Let's cross back through E7 and visit E6, 
home to the Department of Chemical Engineering. This impressive 115,000 square foot building features labs for graduate students and faculty working in the areas of polymer science, biochemical and biomedical engineering, advanced materials and green reaction, electrochemical and regenerative nanomedicine, and more. In E6, there is also a glass blowing shop for custom requirements that support research work across the campus. Just as our E7, the Autonomous Vehicle Research Intelligence Lab, or Avril, is a single-story, 7,000-square-foot building that is home to many of the University of Waterloo's ambitious autonomous vehicle projects. Students, researchers, and staff collaborate in this space to turn the future of autonomous transportation into reality. The Center for Bioengineering and Biotechnology is located in EC4, along with one of the world's largest multi-scale additive manufacturing labs, MSAM. It's also home to the Vision and Image Processing Lab for groundbreaking artificial intelligence research, and the Intelligent Technologies for Wellness and Independent Living Lab, where researchers are working on innovative technologies in partnership with the Schlegel Research Institute for the Aging. The U Waterloo campus is easily accessible by public transit, including the Ion light rail that connects the Waterloo region. Across the Ion tracks to the west side of campus, the Civil and Environmental Engineering Department offers one of Canada's largest combined civil, environmental, geological, and architectural engineering programs. Here in the Douglas Wright Engineering Building, DWE, you'll find our Environmental and Water Resources Labs and Soil Lab. With a lake, stream, and pond right on campus, students don't need to go far to complete basic field work. The Wad I Make Lab in DWE is equipped for mechanical and mechatronics engineering students to work on prototypes, design projects, class activities, and whatever else they can think of. A founding philosophy of Waterloo is now one of our most distinguishing features, co-op. Here at the Tatum Center, we have all the resources needed to match the most exciting and relevant industry co-op jobs with our students. While we're over here, let's stop in for a drink and a bite at the Grad House. This building is the original farmhouse that the campus grew around. The Management Sciences Department offices are in Carl Pollock Hall, or CPH, which is also home to the Engineering Society Orifice and the original C&D. And if you like a bit of social time with friends, this is where Poets is located. Shh, only engineering students are allowed in here, so we're just gonna take a quick peek. CPH has many labs, including one that makes lightning, the High Voltage Engineering Laboratory. The Smart Hybrid Electric Vehicle Systems Lab has built a scaled mini city and is changing the way urban planners view the world. There's also the Motion Research Group, where even Tony Stark would feel right at home. Let's check out Engineering 2 and 3, home to Civil Engineering Structural Dynamics Identification Control Lab, Geotechnical Research Lab, and the Precision Welding Lab. Students with computer labs on their schedules will end up here in the WEF Lab. If you're one of those people who likes to break things to see what happens, the Waterloo Forming and Crash Lab is for you. It's essential to Waterloo's expertise in automotive engineering, along with the Green and Intelligent Automotive Lab. In EIT, the Center for Environmental and Information Technology, you'll discover the Broadband Communications Research Lab, and obviously, dinosaurs, because no matter how old you are, you'll always love dinosaurs. If you take a six minute walk toward the north part of campus, you'll find the Energy Research Center. The walk may be longer if you're waylaid by the legendary Canadian geese who think they own this campus. In the ERC, you'll find the Fuel Cell and Green Energy Lab, the Air Pollution and Innovation Lab, as well as some of the Sierra's researchers. In the Davis Center, we have the Mechatronics Vehicle Systems Lab, the Precision Controls Lab, the Waterloo Artificial Intelligence Institute, Waterloo AI, and the Center for Integrated Radio Frequency Engineering. Another iconic building on campus is the Mike and Ophelia Lazaridis Quantum Nano Center, designed to meet the highest scientific standards for control of vibration, humidity, electromagnetic radiation, and temperature. It is home to the Institute for Quantum Computing, the Waterloo Institute for Nanotechnology, and the largest undergraduate nanotechnology engineering program in Canada. Not all of our labs are located on the main campus. The U Waterloo Live Fire Research Facility contains space equipped with advanced resources that support data analysis and fire modeling. Basically, they light stuff on fire and watch it burn. The Waterloo Centre for Automotive Research, WATCAR, is the largest university-based automotive research centre in Canada. 
researchers and grad students utilize the outdoor road test track for many advanced trials and have fun burning out tires and testing maneuvers of autonomous vehicles. At North Campus, the Research Advancement Center is home to the Quantum Photonic Devices Lab and other engineering labs and facilities. The School of Architecture, also part of the Faculty of Engineering, is located in the heart of downtown Cambridge. This historic building alongside the Grand River offers an inspirational study setting for undergraduate and postgraduate students pursuing architecture degrees. As an immersive campus in an urban setting, the school shares an architecture and design library, exhibition galleries, and a public auditorium with community neighbors. Waterloo is the only Canadian school of architecture with a permanent international study location in Rome, Italy, one of the richest architectural environments on earth. Waterloo is the school of choice for engineering graduate students from around the world. Students who complete their master's or PhD here have access to the finest research labs in the world and become integral members of their research teams, exploring emerging technologies and forging new frontiers in engineering and design. And at the University of Waterloo, students and faculty own 100% of their intellectual property. This creator-owned policy has been a major catalyst for Waterloo's commercialization success for many of our entrepreneurial student and faculty teams. Waterloo Engineering is the epicenter of technology talent, and while there are Waterloo engineers working everywhere in the world, they all started here. That was a great tour, but I think we left a few things out. What did we miss? We didn't mention all the fun stuff. Do you mean things like our annual engineering day? Well, that is an awesome day, but what about the athletics building, football field, food courts, libraries, the Student Life Center, campus wellness services, residences, Phil's, Morty's, Mel's, Ethel's, Chainsaw, and tons of other stuff? It's Waterloo Engineering. There's always more to see. But come check it out for yourself.